Okay. Okay, then let's start. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is May and I am the co-founder and chief product officer of TechDev Academy. Thank you for joining us today. We are happy to host such a unique webinar in TechDev Academy. Before starting, I just would like to give a brief information about uh, what we are doing. Uh, we are a Silicon Valley based tech company and our mission is to provide you the tech training in a variety of programming and game development workshops, including Scratch, Roblox, Python, C++, Java, JavaScript, and many others. Especially after the COVID-19, uh, we organized over 50 free workshops and webinars to give back to the community uh, during this uh, difficult time. We will continue to do so. We also have many five days uh, virtual camps uh, for programming and game development. We keep our class size limited for five students only, and we bring coding experience to your kids while having fun. Our camps is to targeting to improve their confidence, creativity, and team working skills. We also provide mentorship and additional support before, during, and after the camps. You can check all the workshops and virtual camps at techdevacademy.com. Today, I would like to welcome our host, Dr. Zene. She has a PhD in chemistry. Uh, she is now a teacher, a science teacher in a local school uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, she is bringing more innovative approaches uh, to her teaching to, uh, to her students. Uh, welcome, Zainab. Thanks. You, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to learning all those details today. I think um, Mr. Ismail will be. Uh... Yes, hi everybody. I am uh, Ismail uh, and I am one of the co-founders of the, of the company and uh, I'm also the chief education officer. Uh, today, we would like to welcome uh, our speaker, Dr. Chris Rogers uh, from Tufts University. He's a professor of education uh, I, I'm sorry, professor of engineering at Tufts University. Uh, I would like to read his uh, bio. Uh, Chris earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford University, where he worked with Professor John Eaton on his thesis on particle motion in a boundary layer flow. Uh, he joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Tufts University. Um, of engineering in 1989. He's involved in a number of research areas, including particle laden flows, a continuation of his thesis, telerobotics and controls, slurry flows in chemical mechanical planarization, the engineering of musical instruments, measuring flame shapes of coach fires, measuring free fly locomotion, and engineering education, kindergarten to college. At Tufts University, Rogers has exercised his strong commitment to teaching by exploring a number of new directions, including teaching robotics with Lego bricks and teaching manufacturing by building musical instruments. His teaching work extends to the elementary school level where he talks with over 1,000 teachers around the world every year on methods of introducing young children to engineering. So please welcome Dr. Rogers. Rogers. So Chris, uh, we are on you. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and uh, confirm that you can see my slides. I take it that's a yes. So uh, hi everyone. I, I am up in New Hampshire um, and uh, enjoying the, the rainy weather we have here. Hopefully you guys have better weather wherever you are. But I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about responsive teaching, especially in engineering. And uh, and so I'm part of a much larger group at the Tufts Center for Engineering Education and Outreach, uh, where we actually have doctoral programs in both engineering and education. So we have graduate students looking at how the brain learns to engineer, and we have graduate students looking at how to take that, that learn, those learning sciences and develop new products. Uh, and then we work with a number of industrial partners. I'll be highlighting our work today with uh, Lego, Lego Education. Um, but there are a number of them that we get to work with to help then put these uh, products out in the market. And then we have a large program where we try and then close the loop, which is working with teachers 
uh, around the world to see how this uh, these tools actually work and how should we change them. It's it's easy to make something work in the lab. It's much harder to make it work with 30 kids in real life. So uh, the so the, I guess the first thing we should think about though is really is well what should we be teaching? Um, so what I'd like everyone to do is just think for a minute. Um, imagine that you were to go up to one of your te your favorite teacher uh, in say middle school or high school and you were to say thanks because the one thing you really taught me was x what would x be math math and science <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's pretty bold. <laughs> broad <laughs> So I've asked this question to thousands and thousands of teachers around the world, and the, the results that come back tend to be things about uh, uh, failure in iteration, uh, learning how to learn on your own, learning to love to learn, mm -hmm. curiosity, creativity, innovation, all of these things that we really don't uh, test. Um, yeah. In fact, things we test are nowhere on the list that people say. Yeah. Okay. So if you ask me, these are the four things I think I'm trying to teach in my classes. Mm -hmm. The first is just curiosity. If you think about it, the, the average five-year-old is very curious. They're always asking why. As adults, we don't ask why nearly as much. Why is that? It's an interesting problem in and of itself. But that why, that curiosity motivates the learning. So the second thing is learning how to learn. So once you know what you want to try and figure out, how do you go about figuring it out? Whether it's a web search, uh, reading books, talking to experts, running experiments, um, it's all trying to figure out how to explain something and then uh, teaching those students how to reflect. And that is think about what you found out. And is that enough evidence to really make you believe in whatever your hypothesis is? And then the last one is self-confidence. So once you've discovered or you think you've understood something, how do you transfer that knowledge into new areas? And that's where the, the real creativity starts to happen. So, if you think about it, it's not much different from, say, the scientific method or a bunch of other methods that have been pointed out there. It's basically uh, trying to teach mindsets, ways of thinking about problems. Again, none of these things are tested uh, on our standardized exams. None of these things are tested in our college classrooms. None of these things are tested in second grade. But I think ultimately that is uh, what we're trying to teach. And there's many ways we can teach it. Um, and one way we can do it is by um, asking the students what they're thinking. And so this gets into this question of how do you balance um, me teaching you my knowledge so that you can replicate my thinking and me teaching you how to think on your own. So these things that I listed here are much more how to think on your own. So a way of thinking, uh, but I also need to teach you what Newton derived or what Shakespeare wrote and so on. So, and that's really replicating the, the knowledge of others. So how do we balance right the, the, both of those? And I would argue that today in the K through 16 era, we spend most of our time teaching replication and very little time teaching thinking uh, and mindsets. Graduate school is different. Graduate school, suddenly your individual opinion is very important. Uh, and people are really interested in what you have to say. It's too bad. It, doesn't happen in second and third grade because there's some interesting ideas down there too. So that brings up the first point of really what is the difference between what most people would call misconceptions and what I would call levels of fidelity. So everybody is making models all the time around the, about the world around them. And we tend to um, have memorized the models that Newton and so on came up with, but then we have our own models that we actually think are right. And uh, we need to find ways of having students realize those are not two different things. So for instance, one of the ones I love talking about is the uh, five-year-old that tells you that, uh, no, you're wrong. I think the sun goes around the earth. It's a great model. Uh, she has pretty good evidence for it, right? Takes you outside, you watch the sun move around the earth. That model predicts most things. It can predict day, it can predict night, it can predict even seasons. So it's a pretty good model. Yet, if a second grader comes home and says, we learned today in class that, this, uh, that the sun goes around the earth, most parents would be shocked. Why? because they've memorized a different model. If you ask the parent, why is their model correct? Why do we say that the earth goes around the sun versus the sun goes around the earth? Most parents won't be able to tell you why. So why is it that we're so shocked when a child is able to come up with a model on her own and has evidence to support her model, um, and yet we see this as a misconception or bad learning? 
There's this, also this question of, of mindsets versus facts. How much time do you want to teach them to think in a certain way, uh, which means that you have to listen to them and you have to argue with them, or just memorize facts, which is very easy to test um, and to see whether or not the, the facts are memorized, at least for now. And this then comes down to the last one, which is where my students spend a lot of their time, is this difference between right answers and possible answers. So in a class where you have uh, everybody getting the same answer, it's a right answer. If you have a class where everybody's getting different answers, now you're actually talking mindsets and you, the students are thinking for themselves because they each are coming up with different ideas of how to move forward. So what is it that we're actually trying to do as a teacher? I mean, ultimately, what is our job, whether it's kindergarten or college? I would say our, our job is to take an idea that's in our head and put it in the head of our students, just like I'm doing now. I've got an idea, a conception, an understanding in my head, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pass it over to you, right? So how can I do that? I can tell you my idea. And in the world of Zoom, let me tell you, there's a lot of telling, right? Because it's very easy. I can show you my idea, and that's what I'm going to do in the next couple slides. But probably the most powerful is to listen to your ideas. So to ask you questions and say, okay, if you want to teach engineering and education, how would you do it? And then argue with you. Good teaching is a combination of all three of these. It's not one is any better than the other. All are necessary. Good teaching is knowing when to move from one to the other. And it differs from child to child, from subject to subject, from day to day. So it's a constantly evolving process. I would argue that we do too much telling and not enough listening. The irony is when you ask any parent how effective is telling to get their kids to actually understand their idea, most parents will acknowledge that no telling was never very effective. What did they do? They listened, they argued, they begged, they pleaded. Why is that child any different when they're at home than when they're at school? So whether it's trying to convince your son not to drink and drive or convince uh, your, your same son um, how a chemical uh, reaction works, there's no difference in how the brain is actually looking at those two problems. So how do we measure success? As I mentioned before, we either can measure success of your ability to replicate what Newton did uh, or what Shakespeare wrote or any of those things um, through tests and homework, and that's what we do a lot of. But if we actually wanna measure your ability to create your own knowledge, that's when we start talking about what we call solution diversity, or this idea of looking at how diverse are the solutions across the classroom. Lego is a great example that they, that they love to use. Um, and if we were all in the same room, I'd probably do it with you. Give you six bricks and ask you to build a duck. There are the six bricks. And what's great is in three minutes, you can see a huge diversity in the ducks that people build. Same six bricks, you'd think that they would all look the same, right? Not at all. And the beauty is now suddenly your duck is important. Your opinion makes a difference. Instead of being everyone have the same duck, so yours is no different from the person next to you, suddenly your duck is pretty cool because it is different from the person next to you. And you become more vested in ducks and the future of wildlife and future of Lego bricks and all that. Uh, so this is a, a mechanism that quickly shows what happens to the way you think when suddenly your opinion is important. Here's an example that a, that a high schooler did just to show you a great solution diversity problem. Uh, he was given, I think it was a, a hundred or 200 Lego pieces and a single program and asked to come up with different ways of moving forward. In one afternoon, he came up with 63 different ways of moving forward. Some of them better than others, but the impressive thing is that same program, same hardware, same software, and yet completely different behaviors. Some that are actually pretty effective and uh, some that try really hard, but don't actually get very far. So this was at the University of Zurich. Uh, I, was, I was very, they had the high school there, student working there over the summer. I thought that was really neat. I can show you a bunch from my class. This was a robotics, so I teach a robotics class. It's a junior level course. Um, this year, they, we decided to make them feed the provost lunch. The provost is the, is the man in the uh, waterproof outfit in case one of the robots went awry. So the robots would take his order, would cook up the meal, would serve it to him, would clean up afterwards, and ended by giving him a dinner mint. Uh, he had grilled cheese, french fries, salads, all sorts of things that were robotically done. The point is, 
the material they're learning is just standard robotics. Uh, inverse kinematics, motor control, sensor development, all that kind of stuff. Same class. Uh, here they're learning, uh, we did a little bit more IoT in this one. So you have, obviously have to get yourself into the room of requirement. And after you're sorted with a sorting hat, you can actually go ahead and uh, see the map that tells you where everyone is and what's being served at the dining halls and where the, the uh, where the um, let's see if I can um, where the, the public transportation is. Here's the kill the sound too, but doesn't can. Uh, same class, same problem, uh, same learning goals, but different problem. So here we had to build a, uh, an orchestra that played a composition written by a friend of mine. Played the uh, recorder, the violin, the trombone, the bagpipes, uh, the drums, the keyboard, the ukulele, the xylophone, um, and they all played it together. Um, it sounded awful, but, uh, but they learned most of the robotics I needed to learn. Again, here we did it with painting. So can you paint uh, the portrait of the Dean of the museum school that we have? And so we had nine different painting systems with nine different methods of painting, uh, including the uh, pointillism, which was very popular, or the ink splotch, which, was, <laughs> which took a little of imagination to figure out what the picture was. But you can see there's image processing, getting the original image and then figuring out what you're gonna do. There's motor control, there's inverse kinematics, all of the same things in all the classes. So what I thought I would do for the remaining 10 minutes before we go to questions is zip you through just a bunch of examples um, of two different courses I taught just this last year. I think I'd give you the latest, latest results of student work. Uh, the first is a freshman course, uh, EN1. It's taken your first semester freshman year at Tufts. And the goal of it is, is it's a marketing class. The goal of it is to learn what engineering is all about. So I taught one uh, on the Internet of Things. And then the second one was that same junior level class again, only uh, in light of COVID, it changed a little bit. So I thought you guys might be entertained by that as well. So let's start with the freshman. Week one, they have to learn how to actually do REST APIs because everything about IoT is with REST APIs. So these are get calls, put calls, post calls, and so on. So uh, LabVIEW is the software we use at the core of it all. So they had one week to, to learn LabVIEW and develop a LabVIEW front panel that showed them uh, when the next bus was coming to out in front of, of Anderson Hall at Tufts. And you can see here are some examples. The Solution University is not that great. Most of them just get the bus time, but they've come up with different colors and different pictures and so on to show you how it works. So then we went in week two and made it a little harder and made it do it on their phone. Uh, so this is using uh, the ThingWorks dashboard environment. No, oh, I'm sorry, this was using the system link dashboard environment. Um, so they programmed a code in LabVIEW that would then push data up into system link and then they would build a dashboard on their, on their phones uh, that would show the data. And they had to show something more. So if you look carefully, you can see these tell, will tell cat jokes and uh, give you the weather and other useless things that you can get over REST API. Week three, they had to then build that all into something of their own physical device. So here you can see the bus stop with a hand crank, the bus stop with cool laser cut uh, um, pictures um, and screens. So they started to learn how to use a lot of these different, uh, different things that they could add to the problem. They never used laser cutters before. So a lot of this one was just learning how to use a laser cutter in a 3D printer. But you immediately can see the solution diversity, right? And so different students became experts in different things. So you can see in one case, they learned the 3D printer. So people would go to that person to get help on the 3D printer. In another case, they learned to do some really nice etching. So they, they would go to that person and learn how to etch because they wanted to then do it too. Once you have a physical box, then you probably want to go into the art, um, AR world, artificial reality world. So here's the same thing. Again, they were starting to get sick of the bus, uh, but now with an AR overlay. And the AR overlay picks up uh, ThingMark, which you can see we're using Buphoria for this, and shows more information uh, than just the bus um, that they have. So now we are about halfway through, so it's time for the midterm. 
And the midterm was very simple. The midterm was build something that I can stick on my desk that will tell me what's being served in the cafeterias at Tufts. And here are some of their solutions from the toaster to the planter to the uh, Disney, potentially Disney characters. I think we might violate some uh, rules there, but maybe Disney characters to just fancy sculptures to one of my favorites, which was the, uh, the hamburger that's actually all cut out of uh, acrylic. And the cheese has the thing mark that will give you the menus, which you can see in the background. Another student figured out that you can actually etch plates with laser cutters. So he actually tried to put what was on the menu on his plate. Um, Jumbo the elephant is, is the tough uh, symbol. Uh, so she learned how to 3D print and printed Jumbo with the thing mark. Uh, dreidels, ovens, you name it. All sorts of different uh, things that students came up with. The other thing about this class is this class is not competitive anymore because everybody is so impressed with what everyone else is doing. It becomes collaborative and they start teaching each other. So about now I'm not really necessary anymore other than to just give the assignments. And the next assignment was to try and do stuff over the internet. So this is the mood pillow. Uh, so there, we have a uh, famous authoress uh, in, in the area. She died about 100, 150 years ago, um, but she had this mood pillow. And uh, if the mood pillow was in one direction, you could ask her questions. If the mood pillow was in another direction, then she was grumpy and didn't want to be bothered. So we figured we had to do the mood pillow. And so we did it with a little twist. We did the mood pillow. So you can see the camera in the image. That's a Raspberry Pi Zero picking up the mood, which in this case is the box, determining what mood it is from image processing, sending that up to ThingWork, uh, to, I think this was ThingWorks or System Link, one of the two. Um, then students at Smith College uh, out in the middle of Massachusetts pulled it down and then had a sculpture that they had built that behaved differently depending on what the mood was. And so you can see the Smith College uh, sculpture, uh, kinetic sculpture working in the, in the screen of the computer. So we had a bunch of different mood pillows, some of them uh, more complicated than others. The hand, you guys can see all the strings at the bottom. You could make different hand signals. Those would designate the mood. The weird cat from hell, you put different faces on and besides scaring the bejeebies out of most people, it actually would give you different moods and then the elephant that you could swing around and choose different elements. The uh, fundamental to this and then the next class I'll show you too is this idea of uh, trying to present students with what we call the pyramid. The top of the pyramid is an authentic problem you want to solve and then a bunch of open-ended challenges that teach you the skill sets you'll need to solve it and then recipes sort of Khan Academy-like recipes of this is how you do stuff. You know, how do you solder? How do you tolerance? How do you start using CAD? All of these kinds of things. And we provide students with this pyramid and students can come into the pyramid in different ways. Uh, they can start at the top and stay at the top the whole time if they want, but when they want help, maybe go to some of the open-ended challenges and when they need more help, they go down to the recipes and up and down. And we've done this in, in pre-college as well as college and sort of track the journeys that people have had through it. And we've seen a huge solution diversity in the journeys as well. So what's important to get the journey is the documentation station. So we have a number of places where they can document their construction as they're constructing it right there in the, in the maker space as they're building it. And uh, we do a lot with them making Kickstarter movies, them doing elevator pitches and all of this. So they, they learn to use uh, those spaces. So now let's flip over to uh, ME35, the introduction to robotics. And again, I start out with the middle of the pyramid, a bunch of assigned things. So the very first week you have to do sumo wrestling, kind of necessary. So we did sumo wrestling. And then you really need to be able to grab an object in the middle of the room. So these are all different grabbers, but you have to control your grabber in real time from your phone. So again, they had to learn REST API and how to connect to the internet and so on. So here you can see them racing. We lined them all up in a circle and the first person to grab it and take it out of the circle one, that's pretty entertaining. Uh, there's all sorts of strategies there. Making your own line follower was to teach them some basics, some electronics. And you can see also some uh, laser cutting and 3D printing happened here. Their juniors already said pretty good at that stuff by this point. Uh, then we had uh, haptic feedback. And the idea there was, can you feel an image? So this is an uh, image for the blind, essentially. And so you can see a couple different examples of what they built. They, they had two teams working together, one that had a haptic feedback on a joystick and the other that actually had the gantry system that uh, had a light sensor that measured light or dark and then fed back. And the idea was we put a wall between those two things and they had to figure out what letter we had written out on the table based on could they feel when it was dark and feel when it was light. 
We then moved into some AI stuff. So Magic Conductor was an AI problem. It's basically a small Arduino uh, Nano and has, a, has an accelerator, has a full IMU on it. And so they built their own little model for the IMU, correlating it to different uh, motions. And so from those motions, they could come up with different motions that you'd made. So whether you did this or this or this or this, and then they correlated that to a tone. And then they had to perform in, in front of the entire class a piece by moving the baton around. Uh, and it was very entertaining. Most of my teaching is just for me to be entertained. So then came midterm time. Uh, and so this one, uh, we had you, you had to throw the ball into the cup. The problem is I don't tell you where the cup is going to be. So I put the cup in front of your machine. It measures the distance to the cup and it figures out how hard to hit the ball so the ball just goes into the cup. It's a great one to do because it actually, Newton's rules work fairly well here, but you can also do it uh, with a linear regression model. And so we did both and we compared the two. And you can see one of my favorites was on the left uh, that shot the ball all the way across the room. So the cup had to be a little further for that one. Then we used teachable machines to do uh, sorting of Lego pieces. If you haven't played with teachable machines, I highly recommend it. It's a very well-designed uh, UI out of Google. Um, but you can quickly teach a machine, either recognize audio or recognize pictures. And so they would sort uh, the different Lego pieces. Well, it wasn't very fast, but it was pretty accurate. And then we had the final project. And the final project originally was going to be, we were going to make robots that cook cupcakes to your specifications, packaged them up, and delivered them with an autonomous car to wherever you wanted to go. Unfortunately, COVID put an end to all that. And so instead, everyone went back uh, to their homes all across the US with their Lego sets. And so we had 28 Lego sets in 28 rooms across the US. Uh, and the idea was to move a ball from one side of the room to the other. And uh, we had a number, so it's basically a Rube Goldberg, and we had a number of different uh, activities. So this was a dog that brought the ball that responded to voice commands. This one would actually do camera recognition. There's a camera there that would recognize the, the right thing that had the ball in it and take it over. This was a mini golf game that of course you had to play. This was a video game that had a Lego version of it, physical version of it. We had a number of different robotic arms, a ball thrower left over from the midterm, thing that would drop it from the sky. And eventually this ball made it all the way across. Uh, this would catch it, drop it just at the right time. Another voice command horse that went across the room. This one used every single piece in the Lego set. So that was what she was most proud of. Uh, line follower galore that walked its way. This one you turn by putting up your fingers, it would turn that many times and then send the ball on its merry way. This one tracked the motion of the ball. Actually, on the left, you can see a re uh, path it took. This was uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park. And then, of course, you had to do some bowling. Uh, nice robotic arm from a manufacturing process. It would recognize which hole to put it in. This one played cards. So if you won blackjack against the computer, it went down one ramp. If you lost, it went down another ramp. Uh, this one, you used chickens to help out. And the one on the right, actually, the student had built something that went around his entire house. Um, the random motion one and recognize where it was to pick it up and pass it along. This one would catch it and then throw it and hopefully every time hit the, uh, the mark. And then this one would uh, just shoot it around a complex path. But you can see that there were many different solutions that people came up with to get the ball across. And some concentrated more on the coding, some more on the, on the fabrication. It varied from student to student. All in all, the students really liked it. I really liked it too. And uh, I think I have a fair amount of evidence from what they built that they learned most of the concepts that I needed them to know because their robots wouldn't have worked if they hadn't. So if, uh, if, if you agree that it's pretty cool what the students did, then the question is, well, why aren't more people doing this in the classroom? Because, uh, and there, there are three major reasons. The first one is this sort of disbelief that all the students will rise to the problem and actually figure it out on their own. So this fear that they won't actually trip over it. So if you tell me they have to learn inverse kinematics, I can either lecture on inverse kinematics or I can say, build me a robotic arm. And the fear is they might not learn the inverse kinematics as they're building a robotic arm. Uh, second barrier is there's not enough just-in-time supports, right? If you, this is the learning how to swim by throwing you in the deep end. 
uh, if you start drowning and I don't save you, you kind of lost that student. So it's this, what do you have in place to support them so that they don't drown? That's very important. And most products don't have that. They instead go back to the, let me tell you how to do it. And the third one is for some reason, humans have this innate belief that if I tell you something, then you know it. And yet we have ample evidence that we can tell people again and again and again. And in fact, not only do they not remember that we said it, many times they remember we said something different than what we did. So your memory is not a perfect thing. It's continually changing. Um, and so often that's why you'll remember that you were wearing a red shirt at reunion when actually you were wearing a blue shirt at reunion because your memory doesn't, is, uh, is not perfect retention. And it's true whether you're memorizing chemistry facts or you're um, remembering what color shirt you had. The last thing and the thing I want to end on is this question of, okay, well, let's say we do have something that is pretty good. and Let's say we want to scale it. Um, should we be scaling these things? And I contend that the world is much more worried about scaling than it should be, right? The Singapore math, the, this product, the, that product. The problem is uh, things don't naturally scale very well. So my question for you is if I gave you $10 million to tell me what was the best tasting food, what would you do? Well, some people would have told me they would retire, <laughs> get a yacht, and go taste every food there was in the world and then say, this is the best tasting food. Other people say, well, I would go and I would do a survey across 2 million people across the United States or across the world. And from that, I would get an estimate of what the best tasting food is. Others say I would talk to experts. All right, let's ask the same question again, only instead of best tasting food, let's say the best way to teach engineering or the best way to teach science. How do you determine it? Same ways, right? What worked well for me? Uh, I ask a thousand or 10,000 kids how they learned and I'd pick that one. I ask experts who probably ask 10,000 kids and I pick that one. What's the fundamental flaw? The fundamental flaw is it's a stupid question, right? There is no best tasting food. It's a highly subjective thing. And I would argue so is the best way to teach science. It's dependent on the client, the, the, the student. And so really what we should be thinking of is not what is the best tasting food, but how can we build up uh, for those of you in the, Boston, in the Boston area, how can we build up Moody Street? Moody Street is a street in Waltham, which is near my house, which has about 40 restaurants. So you can go have Japanese, you can have Chinese, you can have Tibetan, you can have American, you can have, you name it, uh, beer pub, they're all there. In all cases, people are finding out, going in the direction they like the most. In all cases, they're doing the same thing though, they're eating. So what does that look like when we're talking about engineering. It means instead of having five classes, five sections of the same class for teaching an introduction to engineering, having five separate classes, one on rocketry, one on robotics, one on CSI, one on whatever, but all of them are teaching statics or are teaching dynamics or whatever it is you need to teach. It doesn't cost anything more. It's just thinking about getting multiple doors into the same material as opposed to just one door into one restaurant. So where are we going next? Um, we're continuing to play more and more with this, uh, this idea of high solution diversity. And we're also messing around more with a concept that I haven't talked about, that's a whole nother talk, about distributed expertise, about getting away from this idea that every student has to learn the same thing in the class. Uh, and the thinking there is, if I have 30 kids in my class and they all have to learn the same thing, then three hours a week gives me three person hours a week that I can teach them. If I have 30 kids in my class and they can all learn different things, then three hours a week becomes 90 hours a week of, of brain time that I have access to. And so I can do far more complex problems. And you see that in some of the stuff I showed you where there's no way any one student could be an expert in all of them, but they could figure out how to talk to people that within the class that had become experts. Kind of the way industry figured out a long time ago and uh, a far more effective skill I think to teach uh, in, is to, to figure out what you don't know and how to find that knowledge in others. We want to develop more quantitative, quali uh, quantitative metrics for that journey and that product. How do I say whether or not they learned inverse kinematics well or not? Um, develop a balance between this diversity of zero and diversity of one. So uh, all getting the same answer and all getting wildly different answers. And of course, always looking for more people to share ideas, 
try to help figure out ways of, of changing uh, the classroom so that kids' opinions are valued, even if they happen to disagree with old Isaac. But that's all I've got. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy now to answer any questions that you guys might have. Thank you very much. It was very interesting, very uh, entertaining at the same time. I really enjoy all those videos with the Legos and uh, your students' creative sides. Uh, it's really amazing to see. Uh, I just want to ask one question at the beginning and I want to see if other uh, people have other questions as well. So, um, you are teaching on the junior level. These are all from your junior students, uh, right? This is from the... the... This, so this, the first class I showed you with the IOT stuff, that was all freshmen. The second okay. class I, I showed you, that was all juniors and seniors. So it was about half seniors and about half juniors. Okay, so those final projects are from the juniors and seniors. Correct. Okay, um, so those are individual so because of the COVID 19 and everything those final projects they did it individually but normally are you suggesting them to do a group work uh, they supposed to do it as a group uh, if they if it is a regular school uh, session if they are suge suggested to do it as a group or maybe two yep. partners or four or five students or right now i think they had to do it as an individual work so i i'm finding it a kind of a, a tough way to deal with it just by themselves but i think they did a great job uh, maybe they uh, still interacted with each other, have to solve, tackle some questions. Maybe they had to uh, meet with you as an uh, uh, individual one-on-one -on -one meeting over Zoom or something. Uh, any feedback on that? Uh, which one? Which way is going to be the better way to, you know, individual work? So you, if you compare your individual work this year versus students' group works previous years. Which, which one was more easier or better? So, so I'm a, it's a good question. I'm a huge fan of group work because ultimately no one has all the knowledge you need to solve the problem mm -hmm. well. And so you have to figure out how to work effectively in groups. It, it tufts. We get uh, people that have historically been overachievers in, in their K through 12 experience. And so they don't know how to work well in groups. They don't know how to trust somebody. They don't know how to delegate. These are all skill sets that they need to learn or they're not going to survive. Uh, so we do, I, in my class, I do a bunch of stuff to get them to do group work. So we start out, everything is a group of two. We change your partner every week. We do it randomly. So my favorite one is we line the entire class up shortest to tallest. And then we take and try and make the average height of each group the same. We'll pick everyone born on the fifth, the zero to five of the month. Those will be a group. We'll everyone born in May, that kind of stuff just coming up with enough random things of assigning them, uh, mostly so they learn how to work effectively with other people. And then we do a lot of reflections in class about how would it work, what could you have done differently. Uh, one of my favorite activities to do is to, when they come in, give them half an hour to build, say, a robot that uh, stays on top of the table. They won't be able to do it in half an hour uh, if they're brand new uh, by themselves, but they will be able to do it if they know how to delegate. And half the class will succeed and half the class will fail. So a little reflection will show why did that half of the class succeed? Well, because they delegated it. And how do you delegate? And how does one do that? Mm -hmm. We then have groups work with groups. So that was the, uh, the image, image recognition for the blind. Um, so getting them to have different subsections of the parts. And then typically we will then put, I mean, in the cupcake thing, it would be a massive group of half the class building the cupcake maker and then subdividing that down. And the other half building the smart car and then subdividing that down. Uh, so that, um, yes, I feel very strongly about that. However, my midterms are always individual. And mm -hmm. the goal of the midterm is for them to appreciate the fact that other people in their groups were doing, were doing a bunch of stuff that they didn't un necessarily understand. And they get to see what, how well they understood that. My midterms are fairly open. So if you need help, you get it. And so that you can start to at least learn the basics of it, uh, make sure that you have a good concept of it. 
but yes, so the products are always better in groups. And in fact, the best products typically come from groups when I teach, a lot of times I'll co-teach classes so, or co-locate classes with the music department for the musical engineering stuff or with the child development department for products for young kids, educational products for young kids. And then you've got somebody on your team that doesn't understand engineering and you've got, and you don't understand what they're talking about. And it takes about three to four months for students to learn to appreciate that. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, because I, as far as I, I have seen, uh, I am also teaching in middle high school level um, at a private school. So I'm trying to give them with uh, some Legos. It is even it is in chemistry context. context. Uh, so like stoichiometry, limiting reactants. So they are trying to build some cars with Legos at a simple level. So I'm like getting some ideas from uh, how you are doing it uh, actually. So they are trying to figure out how many cars from a given set of Legos they can make and which one is the limiting uh, reactant in terms of uh, either it is tires or wheels or whatnot. What so uh, introducing this kind of hands-on activities or creative things with the group work, I really think uh, making students enjoy more uh, to the uh, learning and uh, the uh, value of, of it. Agreed. So, let's see. Uh, for some reason, I cannot see the questions uh, uh, from my screen. If uh, Mr. Ismail, if you can see the questions from yours, can you can you check it? Uh, sure. Uh, I can ask a question myself. Uh, many times I, when I go to middle schools, high schools, uh, students say like this, you know, uh, science is not my thing, you know, engineering is not my thing. So they are not interested in, you know, science. They find science or engineering hard, boring many times. So how do you think parents at home in today's world in in this COVID area uh, help them you know uh, maybe motivate them to learn science do like science projects at home do you have any suggestions on that um, yeah I think talking just talking over the dinner table about different scientific concepts or different math concepts or engineering concepts is always a good thing, uh, just to role mm -hmm. model it. I, uh, my contention, so a friend of mine who does a lot of work on engineering outreach also, his, the way he put it, I thought was very appropriate. He said, take a minute and look around and remove everything you see that was developed by an engineer. What do you have left? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have any clothes, you don't have a roof, <laughs> you don't have yeah. you don't have a lot of things. Certainly not Zoom, computer, et cetera, et cetera. So why is it that in the first 12 years of your education have you not learned anything about how this process is done? So clearly to, to be uh, an active member of society uh, in a world that is so dependent on science and engineering, you it, it's very important that you at least understand the basic concepts of it, of, of how to think like a scientist, of how to think like an engineer. Just like a hundred years ago, we decided as a, as a community that literacy was a necessary part of being part of the community. So um, the problem is that there's a big difference between thinking like a scientist, which almost everyone enjoys, and memorizing the scientific thinking of others, which very few people enjoy. And so I, I think they, the kids need to learn, uh, and adults need to learn that those are not the same thing that being able to try and figure out why something works is a pretty exciting puzzle. Um, far more exciting than memorizing math tables or uh, equations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, some people argue that Legos, for example, using in engineering classes are expensive. So, is it possible to do like engineering uh, problem solving practices more cheaper? Um, yes, 
So there are a number of different things that people have played with. Um, so you can first go completely online. Uh, simulation, the simulation world. Um, I tend to be a strong proponent of having stuff in the physical world using your hands because it's another sense and therefore another way to get the memory back. Uh, it's another hook for the memory. So if you want to go with a physical world, uh, there are a number of different companies out there that will sell you cheaper stuff than Lego. Uh, one of my graduate students put together paperbots.org. This was about five or six years ago. How to make stuff just out of paper or origami robotics. You can do that for under 50 bucks. Uh, there are a number of sets out that are under 50 bucks. Uh, Arduino is probably the most uh, well known of the sort of cheap processor environments, which is sort of fundamental for robotics. Uh, those start at 20 bucks, or you can use Raspberry Pis. Pi Zero start at five bucks. Um, you need building systems around all those. So people are sell selling building systems as well. Microbit as well is another cheap one. One uh, thing, everything in between. The the power of the Lego that we've found is that first all, first of all, Lego implies solution diversity. That when people start playing with Lego, they expect to build something different from the person next to you, which is good, um, and uh, it's reusable. Uh, so that it's a big upfront investment, but then it lasts for a while. The downsides of Lego are first off. Um, they can't take it with them. Uh, second off, it's too easy to build. And so students don't plan much before building because they're actually using Lego as a physical prototyping brainstorming tool. And uh, so if you actually want to get them to really think before they start to build, uh, the Lego doesn't work nearly as well for that. So we've, in the past, we've added on things like underwater robotics, where you can't really test your robot except for the three times in the semester where you're gonna go to the pool. Mm -hmm. But price is always an issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. I see. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Lena. Uh, thank you. Uh, so for the, uh, I'm curious. Are you at the same time while doing this uh, kind of teaching? Are you? So I'm imagining in my mind. Uh, so this, if this is uh, a classroom and I am a student there, and I would love to be a student <laughs> there. It's so, so much fun. Uh, so uh, is it uh, something like, it starts with a kind of a, like a lecture uh, wise in the first one third of the semester or year. So I learned that you, you, you showed us a, a triangle that's the recipes, open challenges, and the authentic uh, on the top. So first you tell the students about, let's say, Newton's law, that's the, because they are going to throw the ball into a certain uh, distance on a certain angle. So first give them some kind of a background information and then you tell them this is your challenge, go ahead and build this thing. Or you just start off with this is your challenge and figure out what are the uh, universal laws you need to learn from from it? I'm just trying to uh, visualize the what students are getting from at the beginning. Yep, that is the that's the question always. You you need to put down the the base knowledge so that they can build on that base knowledge to solve the problem, or do you have them try and solve the problem and realize they need the base knowledge and then come then they'll come and ask you for that base knowledge. And uh, unfortunately, there's no right answer. It's a balance between the two. Uh, I think if I, I use sports a lot as my model for good teaching. Um, not many people get fully lectured in all the basic mechanics before they get wet, right? Before they jump into the pool. They jump into the pool and then they ask how to do it. Uh, so, and yet we make our, at the, at the university level, we make our students take two years of calculus and physics and chemistry and all sorts of other things before they're allowed to actually build anything, mm -hmm. right? Instead, and actually 15 years ago, we switched it and we said, okay, actually, that's where those EM1 courses started. In the very beginning, we'll let you start off by doing some engineering and that will want you to uh, take these courses. I will say that since we put that in place for the last 15 or so years, Tufts has actually been a school that 
graduates more engineers than it accepts. So we have a net inflow of engineers, which is unusual uh, for an engineering school. So that definitely seems to help in the marketing. Do you suggest, or do you have any plan, or maybe it is already ongoing, apply this kind of approach to the lower uh, level of uh, education, like middle mm -hmm. high schools, maybe even in the elementary level, I think it is applicable. Uh, so like a workshop kind of thing, or a summer program, or a short thing. I think this would be really uh, interesting for students to uh get involved with early on their uh, life so that they are more so intriguing to uh, learn more about this uh, basic yep. from the beginning yep so we do a lot with k-12 uh and actually pre-k-12 and yes there's a bunch of research around showing that when the student actually uh sees a reason to learn the material they're much more likely to actually learn the material as opposed to memorize the material Mm -hmm. So, yes, we do, and yes, it's a good thing, and they already do it a lot in the kindergarten through five area. It's more as we start getting into middle school and then into high school, and then definitely into college that we spend so much more time telling. Um, if you think about it, in the, in the English class, we're much more, uh, we allow many more students to have opinions that aren't necessarily our own. If they can write a nice uh, paper that explains why they think what they're thinking, we accept it. In, in physics, if you come up with a physics model that is not Newton's, we don't accept it. We don't care what you say, right? Mm. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And think... Chris, how, how do you uh, how do you see the future of engineering? Is engineering uh, one of the future jobs? Uh, it certainly is pretty well at the moment um, in, ter in terms of getting jobs. I guess we're not trying to get more engineers at the center. What we're hoping to do is to get everybody that graduates from high school, uh, from college, uh, either at high school or middle school or elementary school, get some sort of understanding of what engineering is and how engineers make decisions. Because first of all, it's a it's a worthwhile skill to have no matter what discipline you go into. But second, as we become more and more dependent on technology everyone should understand how these decisions are made. And so when things, when things happen, engineering problems happen, they have a better understanding of why they happen and how to fix them and allow them to realize they're gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And we are from Silicon Valley. So all the software engineers are, this is the uh, hot topic here. So it is, um, I ask, all the time I ask to my students, what is your dream job? And since we are in Silicon Valley here, this is most of the answers are towards engineering, software engineering, computer engineering. So all, all the details, uh, I think you are doing both as, as much as I can see, uh, because they have to program, right? The robots, they have to uh, do the modeling, they are also doing 3D and uh, building uh, things up at the same time. So this is this is very intriguing. I, I really enjoy the uh, presentation. So, so wait, you got, you got to convince some of your students that they want to go to northern uh, northern Yukon and study wolves and stuff like that. Come on, there's, there's a lot more to the world than just <laughs> software engineering. I know, I know. <laughs> So yeah, this is, uh, I think uh, because of the, a lot of engineers that are in this area and it is all the time, we are on the heart of the Silicon Valley with uh, Google, Facebook, all those, you know, big companies are here. So it is a hot topic, but I agree with you. <laughs> So, Chris, do you have any suggestions to parents, you know, uh, because, you know, we have many uh, followers um, that are parents of, you know, very young kids, like four or five year old to, you know, college students. So, how should they uh, introduce engineering to their kids, especially young kids? Uh. Um, I think what's more important is to make sure they stay curious. 
Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. really key and, and to role model for the, um, the continuous ways of learning on your own. So working with them, diving with them into problems that you don't know the answer to and together figuring out and solving the problem is, is great. Um, I think uh, one of the cool things about engineering is it's age independent. So we've seen a number of families where there, you know, there's the parents, there's the high school kid, the middle school kid, and the elementary school kid, and even the preschool kid, and all of them are actively involved. And all of them have something unique that they can donate to the problem. So it's, they're all valued members of the group. And so parents will often come up to us after our, our uh, activities and say that it was the first time that they all actually got to work together and sort of be equal partners in the problem. And they really like that aspect of it. It's kind of like starting a new sport together where no one is an expert in the sport yet. Different people have different backgrounds. Somebody's got great cardiovascular, someone's really strong, someone's really quick, someone's really tiny. I mean, all these things can be an advantage. And it's the same here. Some people have coded before, some people have built before, some people have higher self-confidence. Um, so I, my recommendation is, well, my real recommendation is just to have fun uh, and, and show the kids how you learn. Uh, and not be afraid to fail in front of them and iterate because that's, it's the failing and iterating where a lot of the learning is coming from as you discuss with your kid why the thing didn't work and you find out for yourself that you forgot about the fact that there's friction that would stop it from turning or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need uh, great problem solvers in the future and right now as well, because you know, we, we have to deal with this big problems like global warming, you know, COVID, for example. So we all need problem solvers, solvers to solve these problems. And we all, uh, we need like um, good, uh, good team players as well. So nobody can solve these problems, you know, by oneself, you know. So we need good teams, good play, team players and problem sol solvers. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, mm -hmm. Any any more questions from panelists or attendees? Let me check. Uh, yeah, I don't see any more questions. So thanks very much for this interesting talk. Chris. My pleasure. <laughs> any last comments or suggestions from your side? Thanks for having me.